Good morning everybody. Happy Wednesday and as usual we're doing our live waiting for David Gazarian from IQ Mortgage to join us while I will give you a short update on the uh, real estate market in Las Vegas Henderson area. So one of the things that um, we keep on uh, noticing as our inventory levels are going down um, we have um, we have fewer properties coming on to the market than uh, we have uh, um, we are selling at the moment. Um, our report came out. The market uh, are left with the uh, with the homes that are coming up for sale. So our meeting price actually went up this in June. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Alexandra. How are you? I am doing great. Great to see you. Good to see you too. And today I wanted to, uh, you to, uh, to join us on the conversation about the down payments and the minimum down payments because it is uh, very important that uh, we actually share this information with everybody because I was looking at the uh, 2022 NAR re um, uh, report mm -hmm. and that report said that 40% of 40% um, of respondents actually truly believe that you need 20% of 20% uh, down payment in order to get into the home to buy your first home and it is important that we uh, talk in our video on all the different options of what kind of down payments uh, people can expect, what kind of loans are out there for for the potential clients, and uh, should they or should they not be looking into buying the property right now in this uh, interesting market? Should they? I think everyone should buy five properties each, <laughs> but. Uh, you know how I feel about this and how I, uh, you know, the low inventory, the historic Dave, uh, low inventory starting from um, 2008's crisis uh, that we haven't recovered from and our population's growing and we have low house, which basically housing is going to get expensive, especially in Las Vegas. Las Vegas is landlocked. The valley is landlocked. We're going to develop in areas that are going to be obviously more affordable, which is towards Mount Charleston, Pahrump, south and north I-15. But the true valley is going to get more expensive. So uh, it, no matter how you look at it, even the most skeptics I hear are saying that prices are going to explode. So uh, the, the, ma the question is not whether you should buy, is when you should buy. Most people know they want to buy a house. It's just they don't think this is the good time. And um, um, the message is the same. As soon as prices drop, r rates drop, prices will go up. Um, that's what happened in 2020-21, rates dropped. I think rates will start slowly dropping around September uh, to November. That's my three-month window when they will very slowly start dropping. Uh, and uh, uh, people, the smart ones, will not wait for the prices to bottom. As soon as they see the positive news, the prices are dropping, they will go ahead and start looking. Uh, I think the first very important positive news was last week when the Federal Reserve announced that he's not raising rates anymore. So that's huge. That's huge. You have to stop raising rates before you can drop rates. So he's going to watch the inflation and, and if the inflation continues to drop in the next three months, two months, three months, um, you're a bit more optimistic than I am. You, you think we're going to have rates dropping in the next month and a half, two months, I think. So it's possible. It's possible. I we'll see. think that the, I think that uh, the, June inflation report will be a huge indicator whether we will see the uh, uh, whether we will see the um, rates dropping or not because if we have uh, if we have June um, 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 June inflation index going down going even more down then we sure. like we'll be in the threes yes, yes three months of the de decreased inflation and that would probably cause the, you know, like I would expect it to cause the rates to go down. 
that's what you know like that's what my expectation extremely would be extremely logical and um i have to agree with you uh yeah but uh I, I, it, when i say in the fall it's probably the worst case scenario that rates start falling in the fall i think they will start easing off i was uh, by the way i was watching elon musk uh, interview with uh I'm not going to say who, but um, anyways, so what he said is the government metrics is antiquated. Basically, the way they measure inflation, the, the way they gather data is very um, slow. So this government waiting for the CPI index to see uh, whether the inflation is dropping, that, that metrics is, is lagging two, three months. So if you see it's threes, it's actually quite possibly it's even lower which is you know like to me which is okay because as long as you follow the same process as long as they do not add or subtract any factors from their you know like from their system of measurement as long as it stays the same mm -hmm. that's fine you know yeah. like and um, it is uh, you know like you're right it is and uh, <laughs> i would have to agree with elon musk as well that it is like government is slow on the reporting we're always getting the report from the months before, you know, like we're in the mid June. So things been going on, you know, like, like life is happening while we're still getting those reports. And that's why if, um, you know, like if you follow my logic, which I actually take from what we get from the uh, Jerome Powell and the feds, you know, like, and the feds keep on telling us that uh, they will, uh, you know, like they froze the rates and, uh, they would expect they would not increase the rates unless the um, unless the uh, inflation, inflation goes. continues to go up. Yeah. So he used the word pause, and uh, quite possibly, if he drops, here's here's something that could happen. Okay, so I don't want to give a false picture. False. We want to be 100% transparent. My fear is, as soon as he says he's dropping rates, we all get so excited. We all go buy five houses each. And that just shoots up the inflation up again. And he starts cranking on the, infl the interest rate again to kind of calm us down. So uh, that's why he's sort of injecting a bit of fear uh, and is very careful in what he says. He doesn't want us to get, um, you know, uh, overly exuberant, uh, irrationally. Uh, Alan Greenspan used the word irrationally exuberant, which was, you know, people were... You know, for years quoting him and i would be happy to you know like i would be happy if we were all in the position where you know like with a little bit lower rates we would all go and buy five houses that everybody has that kind of means to go and buy uh you know like at least one house that's you know like this is what i wish for everybody but um i want to circle back to this uh you know, like buying the house, buying the house in the current interest rates, buying the house in the during the interest rates when they go lower. So obviously, you know, like obviously we have this huge amount of buyers who are quali pre-qualified, you know, like who are shopping right now or who are just sitting there, you know, like with their pre-qualification letters or pre-approval letters waiting for those rates to drop. And they're trying to time the market. They're, they're trying to, yes. you know, like they're trying to do the best. And uh, that's the, you know, like this is the question that we discuss most of the time. Is it a good time to buy them? Is it a good time to buy the house? Um, here's what this boils down to. If you're trying to pay a good price for a house, this is probably the best time. That's my opinion. That is my opinion. And and let me disclose that obviously but most people are obviously everyone wants to pay a good price for the house and they go and negotiate and haggle with the seller but most people look at how buying process is can i afford the monthly payment the monthly payment is unaffordable because of the interest rates and uh it will become affordable a year from now when rates drop is another one of my opinions that right before the elections will have low interest rates. The problem is the house you're trying to get, you will underpay, I'm sorry, overpay uh, quite a bit because I have a feeling prices will go up in the next year and a half. Some people tell me, you know, David, they will not. 
we've got a commercial real estate crash coming quite possibly quite possibly office buildings in the united states will become empty in the next two years and that will uh kill some banks that may make the federal reserve become more strict uh that may have some ripple effects into housing although it has no direct correlation okay so when i say these things people dm me they're like david why are you we don't think it's that rosy it is that rosy because for four years people haven't bought homes and uh as soon as they can afford the monthly payment they will alexandra so most First time home buyers look at the monthly payment, not the price. So no matter how much you and I say that prices are better now, they will go up next year. They will probably still wait till next year for the rates to drop and for that payment to become affordable. Well, you know, like I would say everybody is entitled to their strategy. Of course. You know, and I welcome everybody's uh, opinion and their strategy. So to me, what I usually ask people is that what does it mean for you if it's a good time or if it's a bad time like you said if people are trying to time the market with the prices so how do you know if the houses are going up or down so most people they call will you and ask you. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately no unfortunately most people they will have their search set up on a certain area or they will favor certain few homes uh, on Zillow or the, you know, like a Redfin or Realtor.com on the, like on the website of their preference. This is what they would do. And then uh, obviously these are going to be the best looking, the most manicured homes or properties, you know, like whether it's a condo or a townhouse, but it's going to be the cutest looking properties out there. And then they will see that if those properties are not sold and the uh, the prices are being adjusted, and this is where people get their feeling of, oh my God, you know, like uh, all those homes that I picked, you know, the prices are coming down. So the market must be coming down. But at the same time, if you look at the strict data and we look at the data across the valley and this is what you know like this is what every licensed real estate agent has the information for we have the information from our association and the association actually analyzes the numbers we get the, the data from the numbers on the residential properties in clark county and um, when the analysis comes you will see that our median home price actually increased in the more in the months of may we had the medium home price increase. So we had our medium home prices in uh, December, January, and February. They were around 425. Right now we're at 444. Hmm. Five percent increase. Our, exactly. Now also the data that we received in this May report says that 53% of homes are actually being sold in the first 30 days of hitting the market. And that is, uh, you know, like that is something that I keep on repeating to everybody, uh, like, you know, like during to our lives, the homes, they don't, you know, like they don't stay on the market too much. Like, yes, we still have a little bit of a stagnant inventory, and it is very interesting how the real estate market works. We have zero to 30 days that are, you know, like once you hit the market, this is your best timing to, you know, like to actually go under the contract. Then we have 30 to 60 days. This is like the best, the best strategy to sell the house within that time. You know, like is to drop the price a little bit to mm -hmm. do a few open houses and revamp your listing. Then we have 60 to 90 days. This is when most of the listings, like they go stagnant, you know, and then when it hits 120 days, majority of those listings sell. So it's not like if you see something, you know, like going, sitting on the market 100, 120 days plus, then there is something really off with the property. There could be like a non-copywriting owner or somebody who is not actually motivated to them, or there is some issue. But that's what 
we have, you know, like that's what we have with our inventory. But the cluster of those homes that actually cross the 60 days mark is not that big. And those are the people that you can still negotiate with. Those are the people that most likely will be uh, will be motivated and they will be inclined, more inclined to to get you at least a little bit of the closing costs or a little bit of the money to buy down the rate. Now, you know, like for those of uh, our clients who are concerned about the rates, I want you to remind them about the three, two, one, and two, one buy down programs. And why are those so important? Why are those the most opportunistic programs at this moment? Oh, you want me to tell them? Okay. Um... First of all, I love the two to one, three to one for what one simple means? reason. First of all, let's break it down what it means. Let's translate of it course. to human language. Yeah, yeah. So three to one basically means let's understand what your monthly payment is at seven and a half today. Okay, let's say it's an X number. Minus three percent, four and a half percent. What's your monthly payment? How much are you saving? You're saving, let's say, five hundred bucks. Okay. So in the first year, if hypothetically your rate was lower by three percent from today's rates you would say 500 per year that would be i don't know six thousand annually the second year it's lower than two percent from today's rates which is five and a half percent from seven and a half let's say you're saving 300 a year the third year it's lower than one percent in today's rate so for the first three years it's low first first year is lower than three percent second year two third year three fourth year goes back to today's rates this is what's called a temporary rate buy down three to one or two to one why i like this alexandra so much is because let's say everyone and their grandma is expecting rates to drop to bottom not even drop at bottom next year by the elections and if this happens you go from seven and a half to six or five and a half that looks attractive today that's going to be very expensive next year okay so if even if you down. if the rates go down so even if you're sitting on five and a half and you think it's really good rates are look you know rates are four and a quarter or 4.75 you're going to still refinance now with the temporary buy downs whatever you haven't used you can apply to your principal so it's not lost money however if you do a long uh the permanent buy down which is for the apply to the 30 year uh of the principal then it's lost first of all it's more expensive uh so go from seven and a half down to i don't know high sixes or low sevens let's say seven or 6.7 whatever it's going to co cost quite a bit of money it takes years to recoup that money when rates drop you're still you're not going to care about the 6.75 when rates are five or 4.7 you're going to refi into those low rates all of a sudden effectively whatever you spent on this buy down you didn't have enough time to recoup so if you're expecting rates to drop um to the temporary buy down is better because you'll be able to, whatever amount you haven't used you'll be able to apply it towards principal lower your principal debt so uh so the uh three two one or two one buy down that is a gradual buy down of the interest rate where on the initial year you might have the interest rate that is lower by two or three percent depends on the program and then uh, like every year is going to adjust by 1%, correct? Until, sure. until the, the initial rate that was in place when you were acquiring the loan. That's correct. Excellent. And um, is that something that who can pay for it? Is that something that the seller can pay for? Is it something that the buyer can pay for? Anyone can pay for it. The last August when these rates came out, they were only allowed to be paid by the seller, but right now, um, the buyer can pay for it. The, anyone can pay for it. The, this, in some cases, even some agents are paying partially for it. So excellent. <clears throat> and then uh, another thing: yeah, are the are those available for all types of loans, FHA, VA, conventional, or only certain type of loan? They are available for conventional, the VA, and FHA. I'm not sure about USDA. Okay. 
Okay, and how about the uh, how about the are those available for the primary residences only for the owner yes. occupied, or are they available for the investors as well? Owner rock, not investors. Only for the owner occupants. Excellent. Now, David, I do want to circle back to the uh, to the down payments. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about uh, you know like is it actually beneficial or not beneficial for people to put more money down like what are the um tell me what are the cases like what are the reasons for people to put higher down payment and what are the reasons for people to put lower down payment well the higher down payment means two things the higher the down payment the smaller your loan and in in case of a conventional loan, you may even with twenty percent down, you may even get rid of PMI. So that's a big chunk of savings immediately. Um, that that's uh, about it. Please break down PMI. Private mortgage insurance, yes. And yeah. on a loan of five hundred thousand, what are we looking like? Which uh, which fraction of a payment it would be, or what kind of? It's what? it's it's a huge table uh, for conventional loans the biggest uh, deciding factor for a cost of PMI the there's a, a, a percentage uh, is usually the credit score credit score is the number one biggest deciding factor when it comes to conventional PMIs you know someone with uh, 620 credit score 750 credit score could have a difference of five six hundred dollars per month in PMI wow. so yeah so the rate effectively becomes irrelevant uh, when you have bad credit score, your PMI is so expensive. So, shall we pay? Like, shall we bring our listeners' attention to the fact that if you're placing less, like, if your down payment is less than twenty percent, then the reason, like, one of the reasons why your monthly mortgage payment is going to be higher, is because you're going to have uh, this private mortgage insurance as the part of your monthly payment. They, that can uh, that can be pricey. That can run you several hundred dollars Depends. per month. Depends on your loan. It's a percentage of the loan amount, and the biggest factor is your credit score. And in some cases, if a client's credit score is low, then we'll probably look at an FHA option. Offer the FHA option because FHA has a relatively low PMI, and um, that will, you know, sometimes uh, result in a lower monthly payment. But the difference difference between the FHA PMI and conventional PMI is that FHA is cheaper, but you keep it through the lifetime of the loan, correct? You That's correct. Matter. It doesn't matter how much equity you oh. have. Oh, oh, let's, with... let's, let's be accurate there. So with 3.5% down payment, um, your PMI for the FHA is there for the life of the loan. Once you put 5% or more down, excuse me, 10% or more down, um, your PMI is only there for 10 years. It drops off automatically in 10 years. For the FHA loans? For the FHA. Oh, this is something I didn't know. Yeah, so 10% down goes away in 10 years. Excellent. So it goes away automatically. There's automatically. No, no, 120 months is basically what it is. Excellent. And for the conventional, uh, what is the difference for the conventional? So for the conventional, we figured out that it's a little PMI is going to be a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. However, there are different <clears throat> that apply to conventional. So a conventional, you can you can buy a conventional home with five percent down. A lot of times with three percent down, the three percent down is the special first time home buyer program. It's got a different. The PMI table, the lower your down payment, the higher your PMI is going to be. The higher your loan amount, the higher your PMI is going to be. But again, it all depends. All things equal, the person with the better credit score is going to get a better PMI. Okay, but that PMI, uh, will I be able to apply to the bank and ask the bank to drop it once I have 22% equity without refinancing that loan? Yes, that's correct. That happens very often. Clients call me, David, I want to refi, get rid of my PMI. If uh, two things have to happen, you got to have 22% of equity from um, today's value. Uh, and you have to have had your mortgage for two years.
you have to have had the mortgage for two years. And you call the bank, they look at the value. In some cases, they, they remove automatically. In some other cases, they may say, send an appraiser. Um, if you have built 20% from the time you bought the house, from the price of the original purchase, then um, don't worry about the, 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 uh, the two-year stipulation or appraiser, whatever you call them. They look at your original purchase price. You've got 20% equity. Let's say you made a big um, payment. Um, they will automatically remove your PMI. But let's say I bought the house for $300,000. <clears> <000, throat> you know, and um, like a year and a half, a year and a half from now, my house yeah. is worth uh, four fifty. I don't know if it's if it's in percentage. <laughs> it's like thirty percent. Well, it's quite a bit. A little over twenty percent increase. Yeah. So would I be able to? Would I be able to apply? And I put only five percent down. Would I be able to apply for the? Uh, oh, so it increased that by a hundred thousand dollars. No, um, your conventional loan is going to have a stipulation. You have to keep the mortgage for two years. What I tell the clients two years. Is, I will be able to do that. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So the, the the first thing you want to do is call your servicing, call the eight hundred number on your bill, and ask them, "Hey, can I remove?" They have a special MI department. They will transfer you, and they will basically, uh, they, they will, yeah. Excuse me. So, and this is one of the ways how for those of you guys who already has the house was the was the. You know, like who came in and purchased the house with less than uh, twenty percent down, but you had the house for at least two years. It is actually worth it for you to to call your one eight hundred number, check you know, check the uh, if you are not sure, check the value of your house with your local realtor. You know, like if you don't want to contact the realtor, at least go to Zillow, because chances are if you bought the house two years ago. You already have huge equity in your house, so don't be afraid. You know, like if you're not sure about the your equity position, like your best way of uh, figuring it out is call your local realtor. We do those CMAs. You do your equity analysis for free every day. It takes like several minutes for us to to issue you that analysis, and a lot of times our our clients actually sending exactly what we send them to their banks to show that uh, gotcha. their position is very strong in the house. Okay. So don't be shy. That's what we do every day. We will be happy to to do it for you if this is something that you need. Now, David, what isn't like? Are there other reasons why you would put more uh, more money down? Like why you would go with twenty percent down? With twenty percent down. Yes. Um, it, in some cases, it may help your interest rate. In some cases, it may have help your qualification. Uh, sometimes, uh, for a certain property, for the buyer to qualify for a certain property, so we have to kind of squeeze them in to make sure that they do qualify. And uh, we'll tell them, listen, we need you to put this much. We need you to put twenty-one and a half percent down to make sure this loan works. It really comes down to debt to income ratio and how much debt you have. How much debt are you planning on taking on? And um, your ratio, your income, the, the correlation between your debt and your income. And if you're taking on uh, quite quite often the pre-approval we issue to the client, they end up choosing something more expensive to, and to make that work. Uh, yeah, well, make that work. We have to ask them, listen, we need you to put a little bit more down here, maybe buy down the interest rate, basically make that loan cheaper to squeeze into the ratios makes yeah. perfect sense now can you give me the reasons why you would uh, you would actually go with five percent down um yeah especially when rates are low um, a lot of times uh, well okay so uh, my clients are like most clients are like either self-employed or employed right if you're self-employed uh, and you have a confident in your ability to run your business, you don't want to put a lot of money down for the home, especially if rates are low. If you're looking at a four or five percent interest rate, which is really low, then mostly what self-employed people tell me, David, I could use this money by investing in my business. I will make more than whatever your monthly savings are 
if I were to put the difference between 5% and 20%, like, what am I going to say? $300 a month? What is that? Four grand a year, 3,600 a year. I'll make more money if I invest this in my business. So the self-employed person has a different kind of math going in their head. They reinvest the money somewhere where they can get a better return. Um, and again, for everyone, that number is different. And, and most people are very good at calculating those. And uh, if someone is on a fixed income, let's say salaried, obviously it makes more sense for them to put a bigger down payment because they just want to keep their bills low. In some rare cases, I've had clients where they would put less down payment, take the money, invest at, in something that would have a higher return than their interest rate. Let's say S&P. Yeah. To me, you know, like to me, one of the reasons why I, I personally like the lower down payment options is that, uh, first of all, it opens up the ability to to enter the home ownership to way more people, and it is easier to it is easier to pretty much uh, have and save up five percent than twenty percent. It is, um, you know, like it is extremely difficult for most people to try saving and try to catch up with the house, housing prices. So to me, putting the lower down payment, it actually has a huge benefit because if you put a lower down payment and you enter into the home ownership, you actually get a higher appreciation on your money. Because now, let's say, let's say your down payment, like your 5% down payment is $10,000. And if you keep that ten thousand dollars in your, and I'm like I'm talking about the imaginary, you know, like uh, house or, so let's say your five percent is ten thousand dollars. So this way, um, you know, like this way that if you put in, if you invest ten thousand dollars into an asset that appreciates at five uh, percent every single year. So if we're talking about if we're talking about ten thousand dollars like being five percent so we're talking about the house that is uh, that is worth what two hundred thousand mm -hmm. well that's like that's barely a condo but anyways so would you rather have would you rather have a two hundred thousand dollar asset appreciating at five to six percent a year and uh, gain this equity gain this momentum because you're only investing five percent but you have the entire asset appreciating over the years and this says this is your way how you can build a you build equity b like you just said you know like with the pmi yes you do pay the pmi at the beginning but after two years without putting any extra money out of your pocket you actually create this equity where you can drop the PMI where you can even like lower your monthly payment by a nice chunk because you are dropping the PMI and you're not making any extra effort you're not you're not putting any extra effort into it it just happens like you live in the house and it happens so you actually let the you let the time and you let your asset to work on you while you're sleeping so and that is you know like that is my like that is my point of view the other thing is that uh everybody we know the law that everybody is entitled to one uh primary house with the minimum down payment per 12 months which means that you can actually get a five you know like get a five percent down uh, house live in it for 12 months and then actually uh, after 12 months you can convert it into I'm sorry guys my phone is going off uh, you can convert it into the into the rental property and move on to the next one with another five percent down so that can that can create the actually the chain of uh, the chain of uh, uh, purchasing and that will create the uh, you know like the wealth accumulation and if you ever need to you know like if you ever need to sell them off you would sell them off and the only thing that i would talk to your accountant and see whether you need to before selling if you have great great amount of equity 
you might want to go back to your original house and live there for another year <laughs> before you sell it. You actually get the two out of five as your primary residence and don't even pay the tax on the appreciation. So there's so much, uh, there's so much uh, interesting things that you can do if you have a right approach, if you have a proper approach to your real estate uh, ownership. You know, like I'm not talking investment. Everybody's like, oh, this is not the good time to invest. Well, everybody follows their logic. So if it's not a good time for you to invest, that's fine. But guess what? It is always a good time to have a roof over your head. And it is always a good time to pay your own mortgage versus the mortgage of somebody else. That's... Well, not always, but at least now it is because now we know that not only prices are not dropping, they're also appreciating. Last year, prices were dropping and we're done with that. It's just, uh, like I said, it, it, there's a two, three month lag with what really happens in the market and when, when people catch up. So, yeah. Um, and uh, when I, I love the fact when, when you said in 12 months buy a new home, Alexandra, what I tell my clients when I do a consultation, you know, I, I tell them, listen, I, I have to put 20, 25% down when I buy an investment home. Uh, I think the best time for someone, like, how do you know when to buy a new property, like owner occupied home? When you live in your home, and if you were plug into the Zillow rent calculator, and you can break even with your mortgage, you know, if you were to move out to a different home and, you know, the market would cover you even with that home, that's the time to buy a new home with another 5% down and uh, uh, rent that house out. That's that to me, that's the axiom. As long as you don't go negative, uh, a rent mortgage is going to be a bit more expensive. So you're going to have to wait for rent to go up and catch up. Once it catches up, you rent that house, go into a new home, 5% down give yourself a nice little upgrade every two, three years, or what, as soon as you know you can afford to. Um, that's how you become a landlord with 5% down, not like 25 with most people. Well, David, you know, like maybe it is a little bit more of an advanced conversation, but uh, uh, like for our viewers, but you and I, we know that we have clients right now who are actually investors. Mm -hmm. and they're buying with these high interest rates and they're buying uh they're buying into the negative investment and i have several of those who calculated their negative investment on the paper and they actually uh they're willingly taking the negative investment and they know exactly for how many years this investment is going to be negative but they're you know like they're still considering it a great uh great opportunity to uh to actually own an asset and they're uh, now exactly they know exactly how much how much of uh, of a price discount they're getting right now and they see the opportunity rather than uh, rather than uh, you know like rather than uh, um, waiting for the interest rate to drop. They see the opportunity right. where they're going to get this asset, and they might be they might be upside <clears throat> on that investment monthly within the range of between three to five hundred dollars, and they're actually already calculating it with their uh, with their accountants, with their CPAs into their, you know, like as a negative investment into their tax returns. But they know that the asset is going to appreciate and they know that they're going to refinance it at some point and they know that they're going to still get much more appreciation on this asset and much more of a uh, write-off as the as the, the real estate uh, you know like as the real estate investor and they're going to take advantage of it for the next uh, for the next uh, several years so to them losing like three to five hundred dollars on the uh you know like on the rent not covering their mortgage payment is actually a calculated risk it's everyone's risk appetite's different so i did really don't want to go on the record and say buy something that's more expensive and, and go negative that that's not what i want to do but uh, people most investors that are confident and experienced uh, they will make that decision for themselves
Absolutely, and that's why I'm saying that this is like this is the advanced level. This is not yeah. something you know. Somebody, if somebody wants to have a conversation, I will welcome this conversation. Why and what? But uh, you know, like I would, like I would definitely not recommend this strategy to somebody who is uh, who is looking for their first, you know, like very first properties for somebody who is. Uh, just starting out this is not you know like this is not the this is not the great start you have to have you have to have enough knowledge leverage and understanding how the how the things work and once again it cannot be your only way of like your only way of getting income so this is for people who are you know like who are advanced mm -hmm. i agree Oh. I agree totally. Sorry, I'm going to turn off the volume on my phone. <laughs> I I I put it up so I could do the live, and I decided to use a different phone, so I could get a better microphone today. And I cannot, like David, I cannot, like, not notice the uh, the backdrop <laughs> behind oh. you. Your natural backdrop, the beautiful. Like those look like waterfalls, correct? No, it's just a lake. Just the lake. Just Looks lake. exceptionally beautiful right now. Yeah. But yeah. Even Can't wait to go start fishing. That's, that's what I do after work. But uh, yeah, Aww. I like it. That's the best. That's the best way of relaxing. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, David, I wanted to ask you one more thing before you can relax and go fishing. <laughs> Kidding! I know you're working. I know you have full work days, and I know that our clients will be calling you. Oh, they're texting and calling. <laughs> oh, right after this, uh, uh, right after this live. But uh, my question to you is, um, you know, like most people are asking you, like, David, can you quote me an interest rate right now? Can you quote me an interest rate right now? Can you please talk about the best strategy? You know, like if we're trying to cash on catch this best interest rate mm -hmm. or for those people who are shopping for the house right now is it actually like is it actually beneficial for them to like every time like let's say I'm going to see the properties like four days a week with my clients like is it like is it actually beneficial for them to know the rates like every day Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday or like what do we like what what is the best way of getting to know the interest rates, shopping for the interest rates, and when do we actually like when do we actually get the interest rates? How do we time it? Well, you you, you don't time an interest rate really, because uh, when you uh, it, it's like it's like day trading. It's too risky. Like uh, you know, um, usually we lock the interest rate once you're in contract. A first time. A typical first-time home buyer, like, oh, I thought you told me an interest rate. You locked it. No, we didn't lock it. You're not in contract. We can't. We can't lock. Even if I see sometimes someone's very uh, rate sensitive, and once they go into contract, I'm going to give them the rate. I'm going to tell them, listen, do we lock or do you want to wait? Uh, and some people are David. Let's what wait. Let's wait till Monday. David, what does it mean to the consumer when you ask? Uh, like, if you ask me as a consumer do we lock or do we not lock what does it mean to me as a consumer i don't lock I don't means the lender language okay okay well lock means that whatever rate i see today that the bank offers i click a button it says lock and not your rate that's it we're going to close that you get a 30-day lock typically locks have expired so this rate is locked for you is fixed for you for 30 days and we have to do everything to close this loan within 30 days locks can be 14 days they can be 45 days 60 days 90 days whatnot so obviously the longer the lock the more expensive it is typical lock is going to be 30-day lock and once you're in contract uh we'll go ahead and lock in some cases we'll wait a minute david so if um uh, I will give you this scenario. Let's say I'm shopping right now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, today I lock the rate at whatever the par rate is. Let's say it's 725. Okay. And I lock it for 30 days. And then 30 days from now, like the rates are, let's say, 29 days from now, the rates are six and a half. 
is it like can i actually have my lock expire or what happens okay that's a really really involved provocative question to be honest with you to ask on a live but okay <laughs> uh, well, I I don't want like here's the thing. I would like to know the I would like to know the procedure that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would want me to follow, or FHA or VA would want. Me oh, Fannie to could care less. Fannie could care less. So okay, I I can, I can talk about myself since I'm a broker. I happen to have different banks that I work with. It's a little easier for us than if you were to work with a direct lender that only has one product, right? When you have one product, let's say you work with Wells Fargo, whatever, um, your rate expires. For, if they're going to relock and you let it expire, they're going to relock with the worst case. If uh, rates drop, they will, they will give you the rate drop within, there's like a one eighth of a percent hit or penalty, whatever. So it's not as easy rates drop and let's let that expire and relock. Um, because believe it or not, when you let a let rate, when you lock a rate, the bank commits money for that rate. Lock is not free. The bank does set aside money and it does cost them. So, um, and we do get penalized as brokers when we waste locks and then our status drops. So we don't waste locks. But in some rare cases, in some rare, rare special cases, when we're in a market where rates are dropping rapidly, I have locked for 30 or 45 days for a client. And by the time we, you know, a, a, a month in the, into the transaction, the rate was so low, I had to take it to another bank, unfortunately and lock it with another bank at a lower rate it's happened before that's because like you're mortgage brokering because you work with more than 40 banks correct correct well 23 but yes so um we have access to 119 banks so we do look at all of their rates so yes in this case if we're in a rapidly dropping interest rate market i will take this file and take it to another bank lock it uh the first bank wasn't very happy with me so we don't do very much of that but uh because they're partners, I mean, but um, in some cases to get the better rate for the client, I've, I've done that, sorry. That is, uh, once again, I would want to pay everybody's attention. That is something that the mortgage broker can do because you have to be able to have access and to see the rates of uh, different banks. And this is one of the benefits of the mortgage brokers. And I know that this is uh, something that our clients like when you sit down with them and when you show them that to for the same file for the same house for the same clients you know like different banks actually offer different rates and i know that you will always uh, like you will always pick the uh, the lowest interest rate and the best terms for uh for our clients because you know, like when you get to choose from you get to you know like you get to you get to assess and you get to actually see the best what of what is available and that's our goal all the time it is to to get the best for you as available like you cannot like it's really we don't have the crystal ball we can't uh time the market we can't time the you know like time the rates all we can do is we can assess later on like we can only look back into the history into the data and say Hey, that was, you know, like that was a very right financial decision or that was not that right of a financial decision. But uh, there are things like oh, David and I, we do rely on data. We don't like we can feel, you know, like we can feel and hope all day long, but we do rely on data. We do rely on numbers. And uh, as of today, even though I our clients come to us with their feelings, with their wishes, with their uh, <laughs> with their expectations and aspirations. But the truth is that uh, we do have super low inventory on the market, and it is not getting like it is not getting any higher. And I know that a lot of my clients say, "Oh, then I'll just go and buy a brand new home." Yes, you can. But you also, before you, you know, like if you were, like if you are committed to a certain area of town, like let's say I have a lot of clients who are committed to certain areas, like they're committed to Summerlin or they're committed to Green Valley. And here's the truth. 
there was nothing being built in Green Valley. Like the, uh, you know, like the last construction that we were going to have like in Green Valley is in the millions because Green Valley is fully built out. Same thing with Summerlin. Summerlin is not, uh, you know, like Summerlin is not building affordable housing anymore. It is so overbuilt that the Summerlin, uh, Summerlin is not building anything below like $800,000 for the tiniest of the homes. So if this is your price range, absolutely. If this, uh, like if you're trying to find something that is more affordable, then guys, Summerlin, like Summerlin and Green Valley will not be the places where you would go and work with the new home builder. You have to go to the secondary market. You have to go and get a resale. If you're looking something like if you're not looking to do any work in your backyard or you're looking something with the pool under a million, you have to go with the resale. Like the builders, like there are only a few builders that will build you a pool. And once again, it is not, it is going to be like million plus dollar home. So if you're looking for a pool and there are plenty of homes in with the pool, but they have to be at the resale market. And if you are trying to stay closer to your work, you know, like it's once again, you know, like the inventory that we have on the, on the, uh, resale market is way larger and um, I do work with the builders a lot I do talk to all of the builders and guess what we are entering with the builders we're entering the same market that we had um, during the pandemic now we are on the interest lists so builders do not have the inventory like so there are two types of them there are builders <coughs> who are built to sell and they're builders who sell and then they build. So now builders, let's say like dear Horton, first they build the home and then they sell it to you. So there are no option builders. So you come, you see the house. So the, the builders who build to sell, like those builders are running out of inventory. A lot of them, especially in the premium areas, already run off the interest lists. So it's like you join the list and you wait and you see what comes up and uh, you get a call. And if you don't make the decision right that moment, that object, like that property is gone. And then there, is a, there are builders who built to, uh, they, they actually sell and then build, which is, uh, you know, like, which is again, this is something that you have to time. So between the time you buy the house and between the time you actually purchase it, it can take anywhere between six to nine months. And this is one of the reasons why we had a huge release of inventory uh, in January of 2023. It's because a lot of people came in and they put this non-refundable, they put this huge EMD that was non-refundable, that becomes non-refundable after five days. And you guys qualify at, at the point when you're purchasing the house, when you're signing the contract. And then whatever the situation is with the interest rate, six or nine months from the time you bought it, this is when you face your actual interest rate. This is when you face your actual, uh, uh, this is when you face your actual uh, monthly payment and what happened uh, last year we had a lot of people who qualified let's say at the beginning of 2022 when the interest rate was a little bit over four percent by the time their homes were built which was October through January like October 2022 through January 2023 and the rates went up their monthly payment like almost doubled to what they what their expectation was in January of 2022 and this is when they they could not qualify for the loan anymore their loan contingency was out and they were out of the money that they placed as the earnest money deposits and they were out of the money that they uh, paid for the options so though a lot of those homes they were scooped by the other buyers 
because uh, those who could afford them. And those homes, actually, the builders went even like further, those homes were sold at a discount because the builders already had collected on, on the down, you know, like on the uh, uh, on the earnest money deposits and the options. And for for those of you who have no idea, so the earnest money deposit for the builder it can be like up to ten percent of the property value, and that's why you know, like it is very important when you guys are. Like when you guys are hearing that, oh, you know, like those builders are offering lower interest rates, they're not locking them up for nine months. They're not locking them up for, uh, for 12 months. So it is very, very important for you guys to not just see the next shiny object or see the pretty number and, you know, like go for it and then lose your, your earnest money deposit. Like, you know, like consult with the, like, Take the real estate professional with you. It doesn't cost you a penny to take the agent with you to the builder's site. But those are actually the people, unless you have an attorney on a retainer who's going to read this contract to you and explain it to you. And usually that contract is 100, 120 to 170 pages. Then go ahead and at least take a real estate professional who can read it to you and who can actually help you out. That's why, guys. Resale market is super strong, and there's nothing better than not taking the local real estate agent and the local real estate lender to the resale market with you as your support team. You know, like do we like do we actually you know, like do we convert 100% of our clients into the homeowners? No, you know, like I wish, but no, not everybody gets to own the house. Not everybody gets to have the great position to own the house, but we do, you know, like we do thrive on uh, consulting our clients and to help them long term. You know, like we thrive as family realtors, as generational uh, <laughs> mortgage brokers who help the generations to go. I concur, <laughs> Sally Ventra. You're like, you're talking too much. No, not at all. Thank you. I appreciate that more than you know. Thank you. So, regardless of what the rates are, David and I are here to help you, to consult you. Once again, remember, when everybody's scared, there it means that there is a better opportunity for just those few who are actually not scared. If you have very little and very minimal down payment, it is your time right now to actually help yourself because coming with 5% down, we still have a chance to, to get the uh, sellers to either contribute to the, down, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, buy down of the interest rate or to, to cover the closing costs. If, you're, if the only thing that stops you from purchasing a house right now is the lack of uh, down payment, but if you can see that you have 5%, come talk to David, come talk to me. Together we will work out the, uh, uh, we will work out actually the strategy how you can become a homeowner with the 5% down. And if we need to um, massage the seller a little bit to cover the closing costs, we've done it successfully for the last six months and we're actually willing and eager to put our expertise, to put our time in order to deliver that, you know, like to deliver that service to you guys. So you could own your house with as little as the down payment. If you have somebody, David, if I have somebody giving me a gift, yeah. is, it, is it a perfect way of obtaining a down payment for uh, my private Absolutely, home? absolutely. For owner occupied and second homes, get a gift all day long. Yeah. So to all of those ladies out there, especially, you know, like coming from the former Soviet Union, you know, like stop looking at the Chanel purses. <laughs> like you can the Chanel purse. I I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Okay. You can invest into a purse and it doesn't, it doesn't depreciate. 
but it doesn't appreciate as much as the house. So when you have a Chanel purse or $20,000, $25,000 that you would like to, uh, you know, like that you can spend, spend it on your primary residence. That's a much better long-term investment than a Chanel purse. Sure. <laughs> David, is your wife listening? <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't look like it. No. <laughs> you see, she decided not to join us the first time. She didn't join us. Yeah, yeah, she's probably busy. But, but you uh, should tell her. You should tell her there was an important message at the end. <laughs> she would never take a, a Chanel purse. I've been wanting to get one. She just wouldn't accept it. She's she's too good with, in that regard. <laughs> she's not fancy. She hates waste. She thinks of it as waste, so she doesn't like it. So she knows that's why you have uh, investment. She wants more rental homes, yes. Exactly. That's why you have investment properties. Yes. So maybe next time we should have your wife on a on a life with us. <laughs> and she would actually from the first hand will be able to explain the benefit of the The um, rental homes? Yeah, of the rental home versus the you know, like versus the luxury item in your closet. <laughs> She, we don't have anything luxury in our closet. Um, she, the only thing that's uh, of luxury is the large SUV she drives. It's for the kids' safety. But other than that, um, uh, her experience is paying a bunch of mortgages on the first of each month. Um, so she's busy the whole day doing bills, but she loves it because she does see how we get to charge a bit more rent year after year. So those 11 homes that we currently have do get more uh, rent year after the cash flow increases. She does see that and she does see the value going up. Um, uh, yeah. So that interests her more than, more than uh, um, any, anything of shi anything shiny. I'm glad. And that's the thing, you know, like I am not the, you know, like I am not the anti-luxury person. You know, okay. like I <laughs> probably have, you know, like I probably have every brand there is, you know, like in my closet. Good for and, you. And, yeah. <laughs> and if tomorrow not a single purse gets ever produced in this world, I can probably, you know, like I can probably supply a little village with the purses and the shoes and the pants and the tops. Like that's, you know, Good like for you. But what I am, you know, like what I am actually calling calling for is for the proper investment decisions like there is uh you know like there is a level of satisfaction that you get once you understand the investment and i think that for all of us in this uh you know like in this crazy economy we do need to have the certain level of security and the certain level of financial security and guys, you know, like I wish that everyone has this uh, has this ability and has the uh, you know like has the feeling in their life of a financial security that was created through the home ownership. There is no right or wrong way how to do it, and I you know like I am for any kind of investment that brings you money. I'm for any kind of a secure investment, but. Believe it or not, the majority of wealth in this country has been built through the ownership of real estate. And you don't have to listen to myself or to David. Just uh, look at the wealthiest and the most comfortable people, like economically comfortable in this country, and just trace where they got their, you know, like what did they build their equity on, what they built their wealth on, and it's not going to be Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, which is great. Like Bitcoin is great for those who. who you know what the funny thing is, Alexandra is, um, again, the, I'm going back to uh, uh, Elon Musk's interview, and I have huge, tremendous respect for him. Yesterday with Tucker Carlson, um, he did say that we're still expected to have high inflation and when and there's no way nothing the fed can do that's that was his opinion that to you know escape a high inflation and in my opinion the only thing you can do to secure yourself for high inflation is a long-term fixed loan aka mortgage uh, secured by a home because if inflation let's say i have a hundred thousand dollar loan on a home 
home prices go up because we have inflation, home prices must go up. My loan doesn't change. Does that make sense? So that's the right. biggest, uh, my rent that I'm gonna collect doesn't change. It's the biggest hedge, biggest, biggest insurance, I, in my opinion, the only insurance policy gets besides gold. Uh, the, the only problem with gold is it doesn't appreciate as, as fast as real estate does. So you, you buy five homes or whatever, even one home with a, with, with a mortgage, um, with hyperinflation that he seems that we're gonna have, you know, everybody's been scared, but what are you gonna do? Essentially, in theory, I don't know if it's possible, but in theory, you could sell one home and pay off the other four because it's gonna be worth so much more. So you and I have seen this in the Soviet Union. We just didn't have a bunch of homes with 30 or fixed mortgages. So you, you have a home that you owe a fixed number that the price of the homes explode. You could just sell one and just pay off all the mortgages. So um, if hyperinflation is our, our future, then I just don't have a better answer, better insurance policy than a long-term fixed mortgage. Well, well, I would say that even though, even though it sounds like the like it sounds uh, as a reverse logic, but the best hedge against the inflation is a fixed rate debt. Yeah. I'm afraid debt so. Is secured with an asset. Or, yeah, the debt is your best. Uh, way of uh, of actually uh, getting the security against the inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you, David, and sorry for getting putting you on the spot again, mm -hmm. but um, can you write? Like I know that we are writing off the interest rate on the mortgage, but mm -hmm. just tapping in into your uh, into your tax background, if mm -hmm. you would allow me. Can you write, like, do you actually write off the interest that you pay for other debts, like the car, let's say? No. Do you write off the interest? No, uh, on no, no, no. <laughs> I heard, I heard many decades ago, before my parents had even planned me, you could write off all interest, including credit card, but you cannot deduct interest paid on a car or a credit card unless it's used by a business and it's business debt. If it's classified as business debt, then of course you can deduct every business debt. So um, when you buy a home, I'm sorry, when you have a car, you only get to deduct um, registration. I see. The tax part of registration, not the whole registration. That's, uh, thank you, because this is something that one of my clients asked me, and I said, I am not sure. I know that you can deduct the interest rate that you pay, paid on your house, but I'm not sure about the car. Yeah, it would not be the day, no. It, as long as both my cars are uh, owned by the corporation, both the businesses that we own. So yes, we do deduct interest on cars, and the principal is your uh, depreciation. That's a longer conversation, but uh, yeah. Uh, as long as you're self-employed, yes, you can. This the business portion of things, not the personal portion. Absolutely. Yeah. And David, thank you so much once again for sharing your expertise, for uh, for giving us your time and your valuable knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, so Alexandra. Much. Thank you for your time. We're happy to have you as our partner with helping our clients and. Uh, we wish you a wonderful week and we see you soon. You as well, Alexandra. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.